Hi, this is Chike Coleman of Rural Reviews. I'm back again with my partner Chuck Kaplinski, and we're here to talk about some movies and the industry itself. So I thought today would be great to start out with what my favorite movie of the week was, which was The Descendants mm -hmm. with George Clooney, directed by Alexander Payne. Uh, and I guess co-written by Alexander Payne and one other uh, screenwriter. I believe it's an adaptation of a novel. So they adapted it, yeah. Yeah. What, what did you think of the film? Uh, I loved it. I loved it, loved it. Um, you know, there was this, that was a topic I kind of wanted to talk to you about at some point um, in regards to, I mean, Clooney, I think, is my favorite actor right now, American actor, and he has been for quite some time. Um, you know, and I always, I get a question every once in a while about favorites, and as a critic, do you go easier on favorites? Uh, and I don't know about you, but I tend to not. If anything, I tend to be I'm harder, harder, yeah. Yeah, because I think that they're favorites because you have certain expectations of them. And when they don't meet those expectations or if they don't push, those env uh, push the envelope a little bit every time out, you become disappointed. Yeah. So in my saying that I like this film, it's not because I like Clooney and I, you know, I just praise everything he does, but I think it's because he is pushing some boundaries here. We've never seen him this way before, uh, as vulnerable, as clueless, as uh, just an everyday guy, and I think that's part of the film's magic. I think part of the film's magic is, and this is going to sound a bit odd, but watching him hurt, yes. uh, and mostly not in physical expression of pain on his face, but just the emotional toll that this loss that he's incurring is taking on him. Not to mention the responsibility of what he has for the island. And not only the hurt, but the surprise as well. I mean, this is all a surprise to him. I mean, he gets all these revelations after his wife goes into this coma. Uh, I mean, you see him just frantically trying to come to terms with some things and, you know. Uh, Do you think he blames himself though? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I think partially, sure. Uh, but, you know, obviously, it's not completely his fault. I mean, his wife does make certain choices, and people have to take responsibility for their choices. Uh, then again, his character doesn't have to blame himself too much. That's why his father-in-law is there to yeah. blame him for everything. Yeah. <laughs> in a, a wonderful performance by Robert Forrester. Yeah, uh, I've not seen Robert Forrester this good in a while. Actually. Yeah, well, you know, he's another one of those guys that is honest every time he's on screen, even if the movie isn't that good you know he's someone you can depend on. Yeah. But you know the, the magic of the movie is, and you know this has been said to death uh, in every review I've read of the film, and I don't want it to sound trite. Because Did you it read has mine, been said. by the way? No, because I know you haven't read mine. Uh, so, I actually uh, read yours yesterday. Yesterday, after you saw the movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but Alexander Payne, you look back at his films, uh, you know, election and sideways and about Schmidt and mm -hmm. he's got that way of making you laugh even when things are awful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my son, we watched The Descendants, you know, and he couldn't help but laugh as Clooney has found out about his wife's infidelity. He slips on his shoes and he's running down the street. I mm -hmm. mean, it is a funny moment even though you know this guy's heart is completely it, breaking. Shattered, yeah. You know, and that is really hard to do. And it's not only the actor, but that director. That's where direction comes in to set mm -hmm. that tone. Yeah. And his films are special because of that. I think there's a balance to Clooney's performance, but I also want to give uh, props, as it were, to Shailene Woodley. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an actress that I've only known of from one other uh, acting gig that she's done, which is The Secret Life of the American Teenager, yeah. mm -hmm. where she portrays, or portrayed rather, a pregnant teen. Mm -hmm. And I've never watched the show in a full episode, but I think that if her acting is as good as it was in The Descendants, that she has probably one of the brightest futures I would imagine Hollywood has seen yet. I know that they talk about Jennifer Lawrence and Haley Steinfeld, but I would say watch out for this girl. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Haley Steinfeld and Lawrence because now for Woodley, this is the key, is what does she do next? What choices does she make? And Lawrence, after Winter's Bone, has made some really good choices and seems to be on her way. We haven't even heard from Stanfield yet after True Grit. Well, and I that know that she's going to be in Ender's Game that, well, okay. as Petra. That's fine, but she also needs to do something else 
uh, more real as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I see Lawrence has attached herself to, you know, the Hunger Games, which is the big budget thing, but she also pops, popped up in uh, Like Crazy. Yeah, which I actually enjoyed a lot. Yeah, you know, so she, I hope Stanfield finds that balance. And now this is Woodley's turn. Let's see what she does now, because as I, I agree with you, she, I think she's incredibly talented. I think what you're talking about here is very relevant, because I remember when Ellen Page came out with Juno, the first thing I was looking for was, okay, what are you going to do that's a complete and utter departure from yeah, this? Yeah, you can't play that can't, girl you, the rest you, of your life. You can't play that girl the rest of your life. And I saw a couple of movies that she did after um, Juno before she got Inception. Right. And it was awful. It, there was no range. Well, you know, it, they are, you know, people are, you know, they're, they're, they're a victim of, of what uh, scripts come their way. You know, you, you sometimes maybe you don't, don't have those choices. It's the roll of the dice. But you know, uh, back to The Descendants, it's just, um, I, I hope people embrace this film. I know that uh, Sanford has had it up at the art theater for two weeks. I know he's having a big success with it. Because it's one of those movies, I, I don't know about you, but it sticks with you. It really does. You think about it, you look at it in different, you go back to certain scenes in your mind, and you're like, my gosh, I, I didn't catch that, but boy, that really was poignant. Yeah, it left me a bit emotionally raw. And it should. Yeah, I, I really think it should. Um, you know, I, Was I, there a standout scene for you that said, okay, this, this is what film should be if you're going to go this route in well, terms of tone? Well, you know, I, I just back to Clooney, I know that one of the knocks about him is, is, is his lack of range. Yeah. And that is often said by people who have never seen Solaris. Right. And if you haven't seen Solaris, you need to see that. I did, actually. I'm, well, I'm not talking to you. I'm <laughs> talking to everyone watching us. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you saw it. But here as well, I mean, he shows some range we haven't seen before. And if, if, if you're wanting a scene that I, uh, his goodbye to his wife. Uh, is yeah. the thing that just rips your heart out because you can see that he's come to terms with everything that's happened and I think he realizes what he's lost. I think ironically for me there, there are two scenes where I just said okay this film really the tone works and for me the first scene was when you know Clooney is up late at night and he runs into the boyfriend who's sleeping in the little, um, whatever. The, yeah, Sid, the hotel room there. Sid in, in the hotel room on the sofa. And, you know, he has this very brief conversation with Sid about why in the world he's here. And he's like... Which is a question I had all along. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like, why is this character here? <laughs> and then when he explained that, my heart actually broke for him. Yeah. I, I felt bad that he got punched in the face. I felt bad that he was so... Um, maligned by most of the group throughout the film. That w his one sentence about why he was there changed my whole perspective on that character. I didn't mind that he got punched in the face. He deserved that. <laughs> he um, did. But, <laughs> but I, I was questioning why Payne or why the author had included him because it seemed to me that he was there for some cheap laughs until this scene that you're talking yeah. about. And then you realize, okay, I get it now. But also as a narrative constructor, as a narr he has got to be there to take the younger daughter away yeah. at certain moments where she cannot be there. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I was worried about Sid, but then as you say, that scene is a key. Uh, the other scene, I, I was torn when I was trying to choose the other scene that really mattered to me, because one scene involved, you know, the, the full confrontation between George Clooney and Matthew Lillard's character. Who shows great range here. Who shows well. great he's, range. He's really good. And, and, vulnerability and uh, the ability to kind of play a straight man which I didn't think yep. was possible for him mm -hmm. but the um, the uh, the scene that really actually touched me was the scene where his wife came in yeah. and, and forgave um, Ju is it Julie yeah mm -hmm. yeah well and there is another one Judy Greer she is known for playing the best friend uh, in a lot of light comedy, she pops up on TV. And here's another actress who gets a chance to show us something we've never seen from her before. You know, and you haven't even mentioned the moment where the Shailene Woodley character finds out about her mother oh, in the swimming pool. That was probably That moment too. breaks your heart as well. You know, so, I mean, I, I, you know, I think we've just explained why the movie's so great. We've got so many of these wonderful Yeah, it's so moments. layered, it I is. think. Um, and... Uh, that's part of the reason I love The Descendants. Yeah. But it also brings to mind another movie that I loved later on after I gave it some thought, which is Young Adult. Mm -hmm. 
Now, young adult, I had a lot of problems with because, you know, the basic storyline of Mavis Gary. Did you have problems with it going into the film or as you watched the film? As I watched it. Okay. As I watched it, I had problems watching it because this character of Mavis Gary is so, so set in her ways of how she wants to get the boyfriend back from high school. Right. You know, what she wants her life to be. How she wants to make it perfect. Mm -hmm. And until, until she met Matt and Matt shared his story about bullying, until that point I didn't understand why we were here. While, while I was sitting and watching the movie, I didn't understand what was the significance of this film. Well, you know, and to catch everyone up, uh, Charlize Theron is Mavis Gary, and she writes, ghost writes, yes. a series of teen novels that take place in a high school. Right. She, her life has fallen apart. She goes back to the small town she grew up in. She's going to take her boyfriend back, who is married and has just had a child. And my favorite line of the movie, when this is pointed out to her, she says, oh, well, I have baggage, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, she is such a self-centered woman. Yeah. And as you say, the other character played by Patton Oswalt, I mean, they're both stuck. Yeah, they're both stuck, and they're in both school. broken in different ways. Right. Uh, Charlize Theron is broken because she doesn't have who she wants. Patton Oswalt is broken because I believe... He wanted to be so much more, and it felt like all that was stripped away from him. And he is both complacent and maddeningly upset that he can't be more than what he uh, wants to be. Right. His character was a victim of a hate crime in high school, which le leaves him crippled emotionally, physically. Yeah. Everything. And event yeah, yeah. You know, I... <sighs> As you say, and this is what makes it a good movie, is, yeah. is that these characters are maddening. I mean, I think that the Patton Oswalt character could have gone on to do other things. Yeah. He uses, this is a safety for him. This is his crutch, as yeah. they often mention throughout the movie. You know, literally and figuratively. As a theme, it's a yeah. crutch. Both characters have their own, actually, pretty much everyone has their own crutch. That's true, but. Including Buddy. But he knows it. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's the whole catch of the film. That's why I loved it. It's because I realized throughout the film, especially when I got to the revelation, that her life, what she wants for her life, and her self-centeredness is her crutch. Yeah. Well, you see where her life stopped. Yeah. You know, she's very much like Miss Havisham in Great Expectations. This one event happens, and at that point, their life stops. Yeah. And they cannot get by it. And I think the thing that was most interesting about the film is that because of that event, because of that cataclysmic event that occurred in her life, she regress. She chose to regress, mm -hmm. and everyone else around her progressed. Mm -hmm. Same thing with um, Matt. Mm -hmm. He regressed because of the the shadowy memories and the pain, mm -hmm. and everyone else progressed, which makes those two characters a perfect fit for each other. Mm -hmm. Perfect fit. Yeah, and of course the most damning line or the most harmful line in the film for Mavis is when she finds out that Buddy's wife feels sorry for her. Yeah. That's the killing blow right That's there. That's the killing blow <laughs> that tells you, okay, she completely went downward and everybody else moved on. Well, well but, uh, but for her personally, too, because then that triggers her, her meltdown at that yeah. point. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the reason I like the film so much is because it is so counter to what Hollywood would have wanted them to do. Uh, yeah. You know, you mentioned Juno earlier, and this was written by Diablo Cody, who right. also wrote Juno. And the knock on Juno, and I don't think it's unfair, is that it is awful cutesy. Yeah. You know, everyone is a smart aleck there. Everyone speaks that way. And it has its initial charm, but it wears off. And Cody shows here and also in Jennifer's Body. I which, didn't like Jennifer's Body. Which I thought was completely underrated. Uh, <laughs> well, we can go through that at some other point. But she can, she can write more than just the cutesy Juno stuff. And I like the fact that she has no problem keeping these characters completely unlikable all the way through the end. This isn't the Hollywood, oh, well, she learned her lesson and she's going to go out and she's going to change her life. Uh, that's not going to happen. Yeah. But what I want to see from Cody next is something that doesn't involve high school. 
Oh, yeah, take, okay, you're right, she does. Take me away from that setting because that's what, that's her linchpin. That's what she holds to. Well, maybe this is the baby step towards that because it doesn't really take place in high school. I mean, certainly Mavis is stuck there in her mind. Yeah. Um, but, you I know, would say that it is a baby step, though. Yeah, but, you know, and also like The Descendants, it too mixes its humor in with these real life situations. She's got that wonderful scene with the hotel clerk. Yeah. Where she checks in, which is really funny, because yeah. you can tell the hotel clerk is just as self-centered and, and cold as she is. Yeah. Uh, it's like looking into a mirror, but ten years back. Yeah. The scene where Matt knows what she's up to, and interrupts her her date mm -hmm. with Buddy. Yeah. You know, and he's kind of giving it to her. I mean, that's funny. Yeah. Uh, she yeah. Sh she shows up dressed for like you know the big city at this crummy sports bar. Yeah. <laughs> I love I love Matt's whole idea of being the voice of reason. Like you need to get the get out. Just do not do this. It's right, not going right. to end well for you. Because unlike um, Mavis, he knows what's coming. Even though he's not really, he doesn't have any connection to Buddy, mm -hmm. other than the fact that they all went to high school here. Is he knows what's coming? But it's funny how self-aware he can be about Mavis's problems and completely ignore his own. That's another interesting facet of the film. Which is what's his, which is his tragi tra tragedy, one of the tragic parts about him, but also one of the most aggravating parts, because I think he's smart enough. He's just afraid. Yeah, that's the thing he's is, he's smart enough on. to know, and that's what bothered me so intently, is he's smart enough to know, yet he... And yet, as you say, he knows what's going to happen as far as the Mavis situation is concerned. Yet he does sit back and watch it unfold. And I think he enjoys it a little bit. I think the way I look at this movie is it's like a very, very, very slow car crash. It is. And Yeah, you, I think that's a good As much as you want to turn away and say, oh, I'm not going to watch this because I know that this is going to happen. I know it's going to be disastrous. Uh, my whole thing is... Until the medics arrive and the police are there, giving the reports and the <laughs> statements, I want to see. Watch it. <laughs> I want to see what's going to happen. I want to see whether they make it out okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the film is very strong because of that. I think that's what ultimately made it more positive experience for me than um, than I originally had when watching it. By the time I got to the end, I hated the film because I thought she was so self-centered. But upon further reflection, I realized this is a slow car crash, and you really have to understand why she is a young adult. Yeah, you don't hate the film. Hate the character. Yeah, I'm hate I, I mean, I mean, the film does exactly what it sets out to do. You're not supposed to like the character, but don't hate the film. I mean, you, I mean, come on, you can't help but hate the character when she says to the Patton Hoswalt character who is stumbling through the woods on his crutch, and she says, can you go any slower? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you are going all the way to the end on just despising this character. And I'm glad that Theron is getting some recognition. All these awards are, mm -hmm. and uh, film societies are announcing their end of the year things, and she's being you know, recognized for this film, and I think she should, because she, she takes some chances. Here. Yeah, and I think my favorite line of the film is when um, Buddy and the wife and the baby come out, her response to that is, there it is. <laughs> I, I, I love that. Yeah. I love that her complacency in not being involved or being uh, loving or anecdotal towards this thing that really has no anger or any sort of spite against her. It's just an obstacle that's standing in her way. Exactly. And that's what she... Yeah, exactly. It's the type of movie, I think, that after you see it and then you go back and watch it in a month or, you know, whenever it comes out on video, I think this one will keep giving a couple things to you after a couple viewings. Yeah, I, I would agree. And speaking of a uh, movie that gives a lot to you, at, even in one viewing, I would say The Adventures of Tintin is You're going to have to see that one a couple of times, too. It's a perfect <laughs> example of that. I... I only saw it once, but when I watched it, I have to say, my initial, th my initial thought was, when I saw the opening scene uh, beyond the opening credits, which I thought were genius. They were genius, yeah. It, they told the story throughout the entire credits. I love when Very reminiscent that. of uh, Catch Me If You Can. Yes, very yeah. reminiscent of that. Um, and you see Tintin on the stool getting drawn, mm -hmm. and he's like, can I see the painting? And he shows him the painting, and it's, Herge's original drawing of Tintin, 
my whole thought was, oh yes, now we get to go back into one of my favorite cartoons as a child. And while it was still that same cartoon and had the same spirit, there were things that I thought were definitely different and more adult about this film, but it didn't necessarily make me like the film more. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had Captain Haddock and you know his drinking problem and his search for the treasure. You had Snowy being as resourceful as a dog can be. Where did that dog go to dog training school? I, I want to know because that dog was literally saving Tintin at every turn. I think he, I think he was from the same litter as Gromit, probably. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, I love Thompson and Thompson as dumb as they can be. Mm -hmm. um, my only real problem was that the pacing was just a bit off for me. I, I don't know what exact scene made me feel it, but I felt like the pacing was a bit off for me and that they jumped around. Of course, one thing that viewers should know is that when they made Tintin the movie, they decided to take from a collection of stories and not just one. Mm -hmm. And so that may have been where the unevenness came in for me. But it didn't bother me enough to dislike the film. I thought that, you know, the characters were all very well-rounded. I think if you want to put a fault to a character, you'd probably have to put it to the main villain because Daniel Craig, who voices the villain, wasn't really given that much to do except be menacing. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I, you know, <clears throat> when Orson Welles signed his contract with uh, RKO to make Citizen Kane, uh, his famous statement was that uh, the studio was like the biggest uh, train set a boy could ever want. And I think in a sense that Spielberg must have had the same feeling when he was given this technology, uh, you know, this this animated, te I mean, I don't know, motion capture, whatever it is, you know, he must have just been salivating and said, what can I do with this? And that's how I look at this movie. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to do an ocean sequence and let's see what I can do with that. We're going to do a sequence in the desert and see what I can do with yeah. that. We're going to do a sequence, a mad chase through a town that has, you know, different layers. So I just look at this movie as this guy having fun. And we're going to see what his imagination can bring to this character. Uh, this is everything that Indiana Jones 4 should have been. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, you know, it, 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 I, I had you no... You could even have Mutt in there from Indiana Jones 4 sure. and start it with him and then lead up to him meeting Indiana Jones. Th that would have been cool, too. Uh, you know, I, I had no problem with the pacing. I thought it was, you know, as breakneck as it should have been. I have read some reviews which said, which slam it for being cold and us not having real connection with the character. But I don't think that's the intention of this film. Uh, this, the intention of this film is to go in, have a good time, be wowed by the, uh, the spectacle of it, and perhaps get to know a character that has a rich history that you might not know about and do some investigation and, and find out more about him. For me, I think, I'm, I'm thinking about it now, I think the transitions were off. So, so when you finish with one place, it was just like, okay, let's go to the next bit. Mm -hmm. And to me, that, that didn't feel organic. Well, I guess not, but then again, I think that's the nature of an action film. True. You could probably say, have leveled the same criticism to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, yes. You could certainly, I mean, any of the Bond films. Oh, definitely. The Mission Impossible, especially this latest Mission Impossible film. Which I have not yet seen. Uh, you'll have a good time, maybe. Oh. I don't know. Maybe you'll have problems with the pacing of transitions. I'm not sure. Uh, um. But, you know, I think that's just inherent, that's, that's the nature of the beast you know, when you're dealing with a film like this. You know, I, I just accept it as, you know, okay, well, that's what's necessary to move us on. All right, fair enough. Yeah. Um, the other film, I, I really want to get into this film with you because you and I seem to have a diverging opinion on this film. I, I'm right and you're wrong? Mm, uh, that's what you're hoping. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Sherlock Holmes, A Game of Shadows. Mm -hmm. I want you to go first this time. I'll go first this time? Okay. Uh, you know, one of the, I had two big problems with the first film. I know everyone loved it. I, had, I, I thought the film was rather slow in spots. I thought it was a little draggy, and I don't think that the villain was worthy of Holmes in the first film. Okay. And I thought they corrected both of those problems this film. I thought that the film just moves at a, just a wonderful pace. It, it goes from one thing to the next uh, seamlessly. Uh, and ironically, this film is one minute longer than the first. And for me, it does not feel that way in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and of course, 
uh, you know, if you know anything about the Holmes stories, we bring in the big gun here as far as the villain. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Yeah. Moriarty finally shows up, and he is every bit as worthy of Holmes as we would expect him to be. So I think those two problems were corrected in this. I find the banter between Downey and Law I thought was even better this time out. I think we get to know them a little bit better, and we understand the relationship better here. Uh, and I like the variation they put on Holmes. He's really uh, very much at the edge here. Uh, you know, we, we get the, uh, the illusion that very quickly that he's starting to experiment with drugs. Uh, Mrs. Hudson said that he's eating cocoa leaves, which is never a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, he really, yeah. you know, is, is uh, completely unkempt when we see him. This mm -hmm. whole Moriarty thing has him on edge, as does the um, marriage of uh, Dr. Watson. Mm -hmm. So I like the fact that we see him not quite together and that he is manic in the film. It gives us a little bit, bit of a variation. It reminded me of the 7% 7 7 Solution uh, film mm -hmm. from uh, you know, about 35 years ago, in which we have a similar situation. But I liked it. I thought it was a great adventure. It has my favorite action scene of the year, the, where they're the, running the, through the, the forest. forest yeah. I thought it was incredible. Uh, it, I it, did like that, yeah. You know, it wasn't, you know, I hate action nowadays because no one knows how to film it. You know, it's all cut away too quick and you can't really concentrate, mm -hmm. which this film did have segments of early on that I hated. Mm -hmm. But with the camera moving and him slowing down and then speeding up the action, that fork sequence, you could see exactly what was happening. But more importantly, you could see the threat mm -hmm. that they were the in. The threat, the danger, the intensity. And it was, I don't know if they're going to get out of this. Um, okay. So... I, I agree with you on some points, but my main problems with this franchise, that's what I'm calling it now, a franchise. It is, sure. They've stayed the same. The tone is balanced and works well for the humor and the bits of action that they do provide. Mm -hmm. My whole problem really stems from the fact that it's not completely period. I'm, I'm a purist. I'm a very much a Holmes purist. I, I think that for me... The, the, the darkened tone suits Holmes, but then again it doesn't because he's much more flamboyant. He doesn't really fight. He's not a fighter, though. But, uh, but remember, this is Holmes early on. This isn't Basil Rathbone. I mean, this is, this is him in his earlier years. Yeah, but I, I think, for me, the difficulty I have with this film is that tonally, while it works... I, I just feel like, even though we got better sense of, okay, what's the overall mystery? How do we solve it? It doesn't feel like all the pieces came together. As you said, Downey and Law do a really great job of playing off of each other and, and using the humor to great effect. But something was still a bit off for me, tonally. I, I can't put my finger on it. I did not like Moriarty, by the way. How could you not like him? Um, the casting was perfect. I've seen better. I've seen better. I've seen more strategic ways to play that role and to be a, a threat to Holmes. Um, Irene Adler was completely unnecessary in the prologue. There was no need for her to be there. But I liked how they cleaned that up. Yeah, I mean, they made her an addition to the plot. They made her the springboard for why Holmes basically wants all the revenge on Moriarty in the first place. Right. Um, I, I think, for me... The t difficult thing about watching a Sherlock Holmes movie is you're always wanting to one-up Holmes or be right beside him. And I think Guy Ritchie gets closer to that in this film, much closer than he did in the original Sherlock Holmes film, but he's not quite there yet. He hasn't quite achieved that balance mm -hmm. for me. That, that's my problem, is when I watch something like the BBC version of Sherlock, you know, you're right there with Holmes. He explains everything. You see everything that he sees, and the adventure continues. And by the time you get to the end of whatever that mystery is, you're either solving it with him or you're ahead of him, which that's what we, all Holmes fans secretly want to be. We want to be ahead of the masterful detective. And I feel like that... I didn't get to see a more vulnerable side of Holmes. Yes, he was manic. Yes, he was crazy. Yes, he was out for revenge on Moriarty. But I really didn't get to see any growth between all the characters. I, yes, John Watson did get married, but I didn't really feel like people grew from the first film to the second. Uh, I don't know whether you agree, disagree. Um, 
Well, we're out of time, so I can't disagree. Uh, <laughs> though it looks like you painfully want to. No, I, well, maybe we can pick this up next time. Maybe we can. Um, so until next time, I'm Chike Coleman, and this has been Real Reviews.